Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to one of our tech talks. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about this uh, exciting topic of uh, digital twins. Uh, we are, as usual, going to be uh, organizing a panel with our uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, before I actually introduce uh, our panelists uh, to all of our guests today, let me start by thanking our partner Accenture, without whom uh, these uh, Tech Talk series wouldn't be possible. And in fact, I'm also glad that uh, not only they're sponsoring this uh, series, but Stefano from Accenture will be with us, uh, sharing his uh, experiences with us. Uh, before I actually introduce our speakers to you, uh, let me say a few words about the material, the context, what we mean by digital twins. Now, when we talk about uh, a digital twin, we are typically referring to a software representation of some sort of a physical asset, a system or a process. And we do this so that we can design and optimize the performance of the system at the design stage. And uh, when the system uh, is in place, what we want to do is we want to actually monitor the performance of the system, detect uh, some of the unusual behaviors uh, if uh, the system is going out of kilter, uh, predict the future performance. And uh, if uh, there is gonna be some sort of a failure, we also want to make sure that we prevent this in a proactive fashion, which means that ultimately we design and optimize the systems in such a way that uh, these systems can actually deliver business value. And when I talk about systems or processes, uh, we typically think of you know, man-made complex systems like a jet engine or a transportation mechanism like a seafaring vessel or even a production and distribution system. But uh, increasingly, we're also going into nature-made systems. For example, one can think of you know, agricultural supply chains, uh, fields, whereby uh, we can indeed do the exact same thing by using sensors, by using the modern technology, we can indeed build the digital twin, say, of a, of a field so that uh, we can do the exact same things that we can in a man-made type of a system as well. Next slide, please. Now, let's also define in a very concise fashion what we mean by a digital twin because uh, there are several versions of what we mean by these uh, software representations. Now, at the very basic level, especially if you're like me coming from a supply, uh, a supply chain or a simulation type of a perspective, what we typically do is we have a physical object, say a vehicle or a manufacturing facility. And what we want to do is we want to build, say, a digital simulation model of this. And what we typically do is we go to the physical object, collect data, estimate parameter values, and then manually feed those parameter values into our digital objects so that uh, if we want to try out different operating policies, we actually run the simulation in an offline fashion, get the performance metrics of interest, identify the right, uh, I guess, uh, operating characteristics. And once again, in a manual uh, type of a fashion, we readjust the physical object before we let it run free. Now, people typically uh, refer to this type of an environment as a digital model. Well, we can go one more step further. In other words, we can also connect the physical object with the digital object, whereby we can get information directly uh, without any manual intervention from the physical object into our, say, simulation models. Uh, for example, one might think of a, a manufacturing facility running in parallel with its digital twin, collecting or getting the information automatically from the physical object. And if we predict that over the next 24 hours, there might be some sort of, a, I guess, out of kilter type of a situation. Here, we can let the digital object or the simulation run forward in digital time, so to speak, try to come up with some sort of a preventive policy, and then manually feed, feed this information back into the physical object so as to eliminate this uh, non-desirable type of an outcome. People typically refer to this type of a setting as a digital shadow. Now, ultimately, what we want to talk about today in, in terms of digital twins is that uh, the exchange, the two-way exchange between the physical object and its software implementation to be automatic. Uh, and not only we're talking about the information exchange between these two systems, but we also want to make sure that some of the directors, some of the policy changes, some of the parameter resetting 
is also done automatically. And when we have this type of a two-way automatic information flow between a physical system and its digital twin, that is the environment in which we're gonna be focusing on in terms of looking at the potential contributions of digital twins. Now, what are we using these digital twins for? Well, the digital twins are actually an incredible type of a possibility for us throughout the life cycle of an asset in terms of its design stage, in terms of its construction and commissioning, and in terms of its operation. So in that sense, it actually provides us with information continuity throughout the life cycle of that uh, asset. Uh, in other words, at the very beginning of its life cycle, we can do the design in an optimized fashion. Uh, increasingly, we see virtual commissioning. In other words, if you are, for example, a manufacturing manufacturer of robot arms, uh, before you can actually install the physical objects into the production facility of your client, the client typically asks for the digital twin of that robot arm to be plugged into the digital twin of that manufacturing line and making sure that everything works before uh, you do anything in the physical world. And once the system is in place in, in the operational mode, we have real-time monitoring. At this point, we can bring in all the tools that we have from artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, to try to uh, monitor the state of the products and processes. And in a very predictive fashion, we can actually become preventive rather than, uh, rather than reactive in ensuring that the system runs smoothly, again, with the objective of creating uh, business value. So this is going to be our focus in our discussion, and this is basically the environment in which we're gonna be working with tonight. So let me uh, go to the next slide and finally introduce our distinguished panelists. So let me start with Mark, Mr. Mark uh, Enzer. Uh, Mark actually was the uh, CTO of uh, uh, Mott McDonald, and the director of the Center for Digital Built Britain, where uh, he was heading the National Digital Twin Program. So he's actually an expert on digital twins, not just at the level of a given system, but uh, at the level of the economy, at the le level of the community, and at the level of uh, basically uh, the overall nation. Now, Mark is currently uh, a visiting professor at the University of Cambridge, and uh, you should also know that he's actually a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, and he's also an officer of the British Empire. So Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Then I have uh, Pierre Sames, who's actually coming from DNB Maritime. Uh, he is the uh, Strategic Development Director at uh, DNB Maritime. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this industry, uh, DNB actually is an independent assurance and risk management organization. And by assurance, what we really mean is that they provide both oversight as well as, uh, uh, as, well as advice on ensuring that your systems, your products, and your processes are actually operating in an optimal type of a fashion, in the most efficient type of a fashion. And the interesting thing about uh, DNB is that uh, we, uh, quite lately, uh, not only they've been doing this in the physical world, but they've been also uh, going for assurance and risk management in the digital world as well. So uh, Pierre, thank you so much for being with us uh, this, uh, this day. And uh, finally, uh, Stefano from Accenture uh, is with us. Uh, Stefano is uh, the uh, uh, Accenture Technology Strategy and Advisory Practice uh, Leader uh, for uh, Italy, Central Europe, and Greece. Uh, in fact, he's the spokesperson for the uh, Accenture Technology Vision. So in that sense, uh, he is our tech person today, and uh, I'm going to be relying on him to talk about some of the existing mature technologies and uh, some of the, I guess, emerging future technologies to ensure that uh, we can use uh, the digital twins to the best of our abilities. So gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining me uh, today. Uh, can I please ask you to turn on your uh, cameras? And can I also ask you to turn on your uh, uh, microphones? So Mark, uh, if you'll allow me, let me start uh, with you uh, in terms of setting the uh, overall stage here. Uh, since we're talking about here, uh, Center for Digital Built Britain, and uh, we're talking about the National Digital Twin Program, let's set the stage, let's set the scope. So what's in it for us in terms of the society, in terms of the economy, 
in terms of the business and in terms of the environment. Can you set the stage for us so that uh, once we know exactly where the scope is, we can zoom into systems, processes, and other types of workflows? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And thank you for such a, um, a helpful introduction to the, the subject. Uh, so I, I think if we're talking about benefits, then we really need to know where the value comes from. You know, what is the essence of value from digital twins and connected digital twins? So I, I think that the essence of value for individual digital twins uh, comes from enabling us to make better decisions faster. That, that, that's, that's where it originates. And those better decisions faster really lead to local benefits. And those local benefits would be in terms of better planning or better design or better um, maintenance or operation or use, because uh, we can imagine digital twins used for any, any one of those kind of life cycle processes. So, so that would be, I think, the origin of the benefit for individual digital twins. Uh, but what we can also imagine is an ecosystem of connected digital twins. So this is the whole idea of having a federated network, having interoperability between twins, getting an information flow between them. Um, and so if we um, uh, look at that, then what that enables us to do is, is see, see a bigger system. And I think at that system level, uh, then the benefit starts to become that we can understand the system better uh, and then intervene more effectively. So there's these two kind of levels for individual digital twins, better decisions faster uh, at the kind of whole system level. It's about understanding the system better and intervening more effectively. So why I think that's so important, if we kind of go at that big level, it is because we have some big challenges just now, um, and they're all at a systems level. So not least of which would be climate change. Uh, but basically, if we want to achieve net zero, or if we want to provide climate resilience, uh, or to uh, move towards a circular economy, or protect biodiversity, uh, or enable infrastructure equity, you know, I could go on. These, these are big system level challenges, which, which just cannot be solved in silos. They demand that we understand the system better and then intervene more effectively. But that's exactly what we said that connected digital twins can do. So this means that we're, we're on the edge of having exactly the kind of tools we need to address the challenges that we have. And so then you, you, you ask um, a, a kind of more specifically about some, some benefits at a society, economy, business and environment level. So, so I, I, I won't, I won't labour the point, but if I just go, go kind of briefly through it, you know, I think at a societal level, uh, we can imagine much better stakeholder engagement, uh, better outcomes for the ultimate customers, which are basically you know, the public, taxpayers, bill payers. Um, but also improved customer experience uh, and, and satisfaction from having um, high performing infrastructure that actually, you know, actually works. Um, I think at an economy level, the benefits to the economy uh, is that we can expect, we can uh, almost demand um, improved national productivity, uh, which would come from higher performing, uh, better, more resilient infrastructure operating as a system. Um, and, and having a better understanding of, uh, of outcomes. Um, and I think importantly, better outcomes per pound or per, per euro. Um, at a business level, um, I think we can imagine a whole new market. I mean, the market in digital twins is taking off amazingly. It's something like 50% growth rate per, per year, um, which then means new services, new business models, you know, new entrants, all sorts of exciting things uh, when it comes to, uh, to business. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the environment, I kind of touched on it with some of those uh, big challenges, uh, but I think that uh, what we should absolutely demand is less disruption, less waste, more reuse, greater resource efficiency. And you know, it, I see this as being a key enabler of, uh, of, of net zero and climate resilience. So, so you know, really big benefits. And I think that we should, uh, we should grab them. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much for setting the big picture for us. Uh, I, you're opening up actually a, a very interesting set of discussion points here because you're looking at a federated system. You're looking at the ecosystem to be able to get these benefits. We're going to get to that. But before then, what I want to do is I want to go back and look at some of the building blocks, perhaps start with individual digital twins. Um, I'm keeping also an eye on the Q and A's. So perhaps I will actually take the liberty to answer one of the questions now so that uh, we uh, set the stage, we set the terminology correctly. Uh, this is the question by Kathy, which was actually up by one. 
uh, she says, in terms of prediction, what is the difference between digital twin and AI? The predictive function is done by AI, but not by digital twin, correct? Now, uh, the perspective here is the following. The digital twin actually gives us the sandbox so that we can collect the information, collect the data from the real system, decouple ourselves from the wall clock time, and be able to use whatever tools that we have at our disposal. This could be artificial intelligence, this could be machine learning, this could be uh, neural networks, uh, to be able to, what uh, Mark was saying, better decisions and faster. So in that sense, I would actually classify AI and its related toolbox as a set of tools that we can embed in digital twins to be able to indeed make decisions better and much faster. So with that, let me actually now turn to uh, uh, Pierre. Uh, uh, Pierre, uh, one of the things that, you know, that we are proud about digital twins is that we can actually use them at any stage you know, throughout the life cycle of the asset. You know, we talked about design, we talked about construction and commissioning, we talked about the regular you know, managing of the system, et cetera. But the issue is, where do we start? How do we build these models? How do we ensure that uh, they're valid, they're fit for purpose? Yeah, thank you, Enver, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, let me start with my uh, conclusion. Start at the design stage and reuse the digital twins throughout the life cycle of the asset. But uh, let me go back to the design stage. This is really where you could say the asset uh, is starting and also the digital asset is starting. And in the design stage, as you have mentioned, we use the digital twins mostly for optimizing the design, uh, making it more effective, making it more efficient, and finding the right design configuration. And typically what we do, we are exploring many variants of uh, a possible design against the multiple uh, scenarios uh, that could be the envisaged operating uh, conditions. And then um, you select uh, in, a, in a sequence uh, the most promising design eventually. The next stage is the construction and commissioning. And here your picture really changes because you're not building many variants, you're just building one variant, one physical asset is being constructed. Um, and uh, you, when you want to commission it, you might want to test it against um, the expected operating conditions again, just to make sure that um, it is built uh, as expected. And um, there might be operating conditions that you don't want to expose your asset to. They might be too extreme, so you can only test them in simulating the digital twin of the asset. And then um, uh, eventually um, you are reaching the operational stage of the physical asset and the digital twin follows into that. And again, uh, the, the cases, the use cases change. You see uh, efficiency, maintenance and safety as the, the main cases. And uh, you obviously test only one variant, uh, the one that you have against uh, possible future scenarios to find out, for example, what might be the right course of the asset to take to avoid a certain uh, conditions. And again, let me repeat, uh, use, uh, create the digital twin in the design stage. That is by far the most effective and cheapest way and uh, modify it and use it throughout the life cycle until eventually you can even use it um, during the recycling of the asset. And uh, let me add um, that we at DNV, we and uh, try to sort of kick this off, this uh, ecosystem of uh, companies uh, doing this. Uh, we have initiated in the maritime industry, the Open Simulation Platform Initiative, and we also developed our own simulation trust center. And we are looking at an enhanced use uh, of digital twins and helping the industry to, to go to that stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Stefano, I'm going to turn to you for specific examples, since you've been leading organizations in this uh, journey. Uh, can you give us, you know, one or two uh, successful implementations and, uh, and perhaps focus on some of the challenges, you know, the do's and don'ts during this uh, rollout, uh, what to watch out for, what to emphasize, please. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you very much for having me today. Um... Well, of course, uh, uh, we had the first cases uh, of Digital Twin uh, very much focused on uh, the manufacturers, 
uh, automotive, for example, one of the biggest uh, uh, first example of digital twin was made by uh, BWMU. Uh, and uh, we have other manufacturers uh, that are now approaching the same solutions. Uh, and we can say that uh, with the, this uh, uh, application of the digital twin, uh, the, the whole uh, process of production from the design to the production of the car uh, uh, went down from 36 months to 18 months. So a clear example of what my colleagues were saying at the very beginning, okay? This is a fantastic solution uh, uh, in which technology can really uh, shrink down the time to market. Uh, we had other example in uh, then uh, the consumer goods, uh, uh, for example, Mars has a very big uh, and, uh, and successful implementation of, uh, again, a digital twin of his plant, uh, but it's going well beyond. No? And again, agreeing with what Mark was saying at the beginning, this is going from a specific business uh, to the whole system, to the society, because uh, we had some reference of digital twin of a port, for example, the port of Hamburg, or we have a digital twin of the whole city of Singapore. So this is going bigger and bigger and is serving different uh, uh, final outcome and, and objective as exactly Mark was saying at the beginning. Um, I would say that uh, um, again, also to connect with a question that has been made, I see this solution as a combination of, these, of different technologies, exactly. So it's a combination of AI, it's a combination of cloud, it's a combination of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. So the main challenge uh, for our clients, the one that I have seen implemented Digital Twin, of course, is uh, to be ready no, to manage the combination of all these technologies in a very mature way and, uh, and, uh, and connect them to the existing legacy that is actually a challenge that can be spread out across the you know facing of the digital revolution everywhere so the connection with the legacy i would say is uh, one of the most uh, uh, challenge and uh, one of the most important factor about implementing digital twin is uh, on the positive side that we finally saw the full exploiting of data and that's a fantastic example of realizing what we have preached for many years. And so taking the value out of data. And finally, with the application of the digital twin, you really can do that. Accenture did it directly in Italy. For example, we have a, we have a virtual uh, and, uh, and digitalized full digital twin of a, of a plant of uh, HP Ecoxa, a small firm but we bring them our clients to let them see what they can actually do with, with the digital twin. And the data tower is actually the most uh, important things in which we show them their results. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, put you on the spot for two follow-up questions on this. So one is uh, you kind of alluded to some of the uh, basic technologies that one needs to have in place to be able to indeed take advantage of digital twins. Uh, you mentioned, you know, cloud, you mentioned virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, in terms of technology maturity, uh, what are some of the existing technologies that we can pretty much get off the shelf and then start deploying it and connecting it to our legacy systems? And what are some of the emerging ones that we should be uh, on the lookout for? Oh, well, this is, uh... I would say that uh, with the ramp up of the demand for this kind of solution, especially as I said in the in the manufacturing area first, uh, the offer has been ramping up uh, the solution quite uh, 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 at speed. What do I mean? I mean that now software company and and Mags, for example, are able to offer a pre-combined package of these technologies. To, to realize the digital twin in a very, very short time, okay? So I would say that this uh, is something that is already at scale. And, and if you need to, to actually uh, realize a digital twin of your plan, you have already pre-packaged solution on the market. Um, the new ones, of course, now we are talking in these days, we cannot talk about the, you know, the uh, very hype about a new a solution for AI. I think AI will, will play a, a special role 
uh, even further than the current one in, in digital system and digital twin. Um, uh, we can go also and, uh, and look even farther about the, how the quantum computing will, will enter in this role of processing data. No? Uh, this is a little bit more far away in time, but in our tech vision, we are already mentioning it as the, the next, the next, okay? But I will say that probably uh, the most uh, uh, potential now will still come from a better processing of the exploiting of data that I was talking before. So if we can improve our AI and analytics solution and make them faster and make them more precise and make them completely uh, uh, un unsupervised, they could be uh, very powerful for the future of digital twin. Perfect. So here's my second follow-up. Um, to be able to implement this and to be able to actually manage this inside the organization, what type of a profile should an organization have? Uh, is it the traditional industrial engineer? Is it the traditional data scientist, computer scientist, or is it you know the new superwoman coming in and then? So what is the right profile for this? Uh, okay. I would try to be short because uh, it's a long, long answer that could be done because uh, I think that uh, uh, the topic about competencies uh, and, and uh, what we define as TQ, so tech quotients, is a very, very hitting point for every uh, uh, firm. And it's not, of course, regarding just the digital twin story but the full digital revolution that we are all facing. So uh, in, a, in a very short words, uh, hybrid competencies will be the future. We cannot think as we fought today as a silos in the, in the competencies because as the solution and the digital twin is a clear example, are a mix of different things. You need mixed competencies that are probably still not fully existing in the market because we could start from the very beginning of the school, of the university, on everything that is made to forge new talent. And this new talent should be more hybrid than today, definitely. So uh, that, that, that's my short point of view. But the, the, I, as I said, the competence is really one of the shortest power that now we have. No? So the technology is going far and well ahead that the competence that we need to handle it so it's it's really a challenge for our clients and for the for the i think for the whole business stakeholders i see exciting times ahead um i, I would like to address another challenge here and i'm going to come back to both pierre and mark on this um one issue we talk about data we talk about the free availability of information but uh, what happens typically is that these are proprietary information within different entities, uh, different parts of, say, a overall ecosystem or a federation. Now, people are already reluctant to share information openly. Now, Pierre, we're talking about uh, basically creating these uh, ecosystems so that I can bring my, say, engine digital twin, put it on your platform, use your open simulation platform, how do I build that trust? How do I actually ensure that to be able to get this full benefit that Mark was alluding to at the very beginning in this federated environment, in this ecosystem? How do we manage the ownership challenge? How do we manage the trust challenge here? Yeah, thank you, Enver. This is indeed um, a challenge that we have observed, and I'm speaking now for the maritime industry where DNB uh, has a part, a main part of its business. And as I mentioned, uh, the digital twins are most effectively created during the design process. And then it is really with the manufacturers, the OEMs, for example. And these digital twins, they can be uh, quite uh, detailed. And then they contain certainly commercially sensitive information and intellectual property, which needs to be protected. So that, that's a given. And uh, any, any envisaged digital twin ecosystem or federated system or open simulation platform needs to um, account for it and it needs to protect that intellectual property. And this is, uh, I believe, uh, one of the principal reasons why we have not seen uh, wide sharing of digital twins or as we call them, digital twin components. Because typically no user has all of the components. You, you just need to sort of build it together by like a physical asset. I mean, 
you don't own all the nuts and bolts, but you, you need to sort of have your suppliers and the same suppliers you need for the digital objects. So if you can, um, uh, if you look at a ship, for example, um, no shipyard has all the digital components and they will need to reach to their suppliers to, to uh, acquire um, the digital twin components, or at least acquire the right to use them. And uh, I believe that's exactly the, um, the the situation that we see. We might not, it might not be necessary to share the digital twin as software by distributing it to someone. Maybe you just need to share access to it, which is very closely, I believe, related to the idea of a federated system that the, the digital asset resides where it is created and where it is owned, but um, you give access so that it can be used by others and you can control the access. Uh, you understand who is using it and when, and maybe also in which context. And um, that is also the, the solution that uh, we have put in place with our simulation trust center. So um, it is a secure uh, collaboration environment, including a library for sharing digital twins and the access to these so that you don't need to share the digital twins themselves. But this has not really taken off yet. I mean, this is an offer to the industry. Uh, we are waiting for this to be taken uh, by the industry and uh, maybe the, the benefits of all of this, at least in the maritime industry, are not large enough yet such that the industry actually steps onto this and uh, takes advantage of it. Might be different in other industries uh, where there are better use cases. Thank you. So let me, uh, thank you, uh, Pierre. Let me have a quick follow up on this. Uh, who should be driving this? Uh, for example, uh, this, this actually makes me think of some of the other collaborative types of practices, uh, say within the realm of blockchain. Uh, for instance, AP Miller had this uh, blockchain idea to really change the nature of the shipping industry. But then because of these trust issues, it never took off. And then recently they announced that they're scrapping the plans. So it, uh, it, it's clear that it has to be a collaborative practice, but uh, somebody has to take the lead versus, uh, for instance, you look at the food trust, there is IBM in the driver's seat, uh, not a direct competitor to any of the food industry players, so they seem to be a bit uh, in a better position. So what mm -hmm. do you, how would you put the analog here? Uh, let me hear from you and then we'll turn it over to Mark. Yeah, well, the, the cases where we have seen uh, early successful implementation all required that the physical asset owner that eventually takes delivery of the physical asset is requiring this from their suppliers. I mean, they're the only ones that can really demand something because they pay. And um, I believe this is where, where we stand. Um, uh, the ship owners or the asset owners of the future, they will need to demand um, a physical asset as well as a digital twin from their, from their suppliers. That's, that's the way to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mark, please. Yeah, if I could pick up on the on the previous point and and just to agree with what Pierre was was saying, but but maybe just get, give give a kind of a, a little little bit of a build on that. Um, so so it's really to do with the kind of architecture that you would need for um, a federated um, a federated approach, uh, and I think that um, something that that Pierre mentioned was was kind of the the need for it being distributed rather than centralized. I think that this is incredibly important, um, particularly in order to um, have the right people looking after the data. So it's so really what, what we need is for um, each organization and each owner of digital twins to um, have the responsibility to curate their own data, to look after it, to make sure it's in, in good shape, um, which then means that uh, you can't take that data away and put it in a centralized database because who looks after the, the, the data in that database? What you really want to do uh, is keep people looking after their own data and then give controlled access to controlled data, uh, which, which then, then means that you've, you've got a, a chance of the data um, having the right kind of quality. So if, if that's the, the starting point for, um, for federation, um, then what you, you kind of need to do, I think, um, is um, have um, a set of, of shared rules. 
so that um, the, the way in which people look after their data is consistent across uh, the kind of the federated distributed model. Um, and what that means is having consistent high quality data models, shared reference data, this kind of stuff. Um, so that when you do um, query what, what is available, um, that then you, you know how to query because uh, you know, other people in the, um, in the Federation are using the, the, the same approach. Uh, and I think that that whole idea of having a kind of a query function effectively means that we'd be creating um, a distributed database. That, you know, that is what this, uh, this Federation of Digital Twins would be. Uh, and then you can effectively say, what information do you have that might be useful for me? Uh, and then you can uh, kind of follow that query up with, can I have access to it, please? Uh, and, and it becomes a, actually a, a relatively simple approach uh, to federation that doesn't mean that everybody has access to all the data. And it also means that you can maintain, uh, maintain IP, you can uh, kind of maintain a value for it. So I think that this whole idea of having a distributed connected model is key to making the federation work. Uh, and, and at the heart of it is controlled access to controlled data. Um, and another, another part of that, just one, one, one more point on it, is that we wouldn't anticipate uh, when you're making connections between digital twins um, to be sharing all of the data related to the digital twin. It'll just be a, a small subset. It'll probably be the insight that gets shared rather than all the, the data on which the insight is based. And so we can see that the actual information flow through this network would be quite small in relation to the total data which is being handled within the digital twins. So that's, that's quite an important point for making it, making it workable. Uh, and then this final thing you, you asked about who would drive it. And I think um, a lot of it will be driven by the market. Uh, it's just that in order for the market to move ahead, uh, there needs to be these shared rules. So one of the expressions we have used is about collaborate on the rules, compete on the game. Uh, and so I think the market will do really well, and already is doing in terms of making uh, digital twins go, go crazy. Um, but what we need on collaborating on the rules is really some kind of visionary boundary spanning leadership. Um, in some ways that could come from government, uh, but I think sometimes government follows in this, in this case. Mm -hmm. And if we look, for example, at the establishment of internet protocols, which are in many ways very similar to this, uh, it wasn't government that did that. So um, I think what we need is to understand you know, where that um, collaborative, visionary, boundary spanning leadership comes from to help establish the rules so that then the market can go and do amazing stuff. Now, uh, that begs two further questions. One is, does that mean that uh, to be able to actually uh, share information, selected information in a seamless fashion, uh, we also have to standardize the interfaces, the pipes, so to speak, so that uh, the information flow becomes uh, seamless. And then the second issue, of course, is that when we're looking at a distributed system like this, the immediate question that comes to mind is, well, cybersecurity, how do I ensure that uh, the system is not vulnerable, that I don't have you know, weak entry points that might uh, propagate throughout the uh, entire ecosystem? Just briefly on that, I, I think you're exactly right about this, this need for that kind of seamless flow. Uh, and I, I think what we're actually describing here um, is, is a, a new kind of infrastructure. You could call it a data infrastructure, but a large part of the design of it should be about reducing the friction to information flow across organizational and sector boundaries. You know, that, that, that's what it should be about. Uh, and there's all sorts of frictions to that information flow at the moment. Um, but uh, I, I think fundamentally what's needed um, is a, a semantic solution. So you talk about the pipes, a lot of the, the actual pipes are there already, you know, whether, whether we want to kind of look at um, 5G or fiber, you know, the, the actual pipes are already there. It, it's just the, the rules that the data follows so that when it um, starts off its journey down the pipe and when it gets the other end of the pipe, it's usable. Uh, and so that, that's a semantic solution. And we can put that in place. And like I say, it's it's more to do with the rules rather than anything else. And I avoid using the word standards because sometimes people think standards kind of constrain innovation. Uh, you know, what, what we really need here is a semantic solution, which is based around data models, around um, shared reference data, and then also shared access and security protocols. But if we if we do that, 
then we have this whole new infrastructure that enables us to connect digital twins, which is pretty exciting because this is what was promised in the fourth industrial revolution. You know, th this becomes 21st century infrastructure, which I think is just as important as some of that kind of 19th century infra infrastructure that, that kind of modified uh, communications uh, a century ago. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, but I'm personally having this uh, challenge uh, as part of a project here in Singapore we're looking at electrification, uh, basically deploying an increasing number of electric vehicles. So to be able to do this, I need an ecosystem. First, I need to have a digital twin of the electrical grid so that uh, I can see the load on the system at different points in time. Then my job is to decide on where to put these charging stations. But to be able to decide on this, I need to be able to have the digital twin of the traffic system, both private traffic as well as for the public transport systems, and the challenge is really to be able to identify the right group of people who would have this know-how, be able to get that know-how, and then on a, I guess, a neutral type of a platform to be able to interface all of these. Now, Stefano, can I turn to you on this? Uh, do you see the same type of uh, challenges uh, in practice? And if you do, how do you go about resolving these issues? Uh, basically identifying the right owner, bringing the owner to the right platform and ensuring that uh, this uh, uh, this uh, trustful exchange actually does happen. And in fact, I like the way Mark put it, uh, this collaboration on the rules, the agreement on the rules actually emerges out of this. Yes, um, it's uh, something that uh, um, I would uh, um, comment looking uh, at the past. I think that... Uh, um, for a lot of things right now, even for digital twin, but even for metaverse and a lot of things that has popped up recently, uh, we are now enough prepared in the technology space, even if technology is quite a young science, if you will, uh, to look at what happened in the past. Now, and so in, in, in this case, uh, the concepts of uh, interoperability between systems, uh, common, uh, let me say, rules, uh, if, if not, we want to not to, to mention standards, but uh, I agree with Mark again. Um, it's, it's, it's a story that we have seen plenty of time and it's still a result some, in some area, okay? But I, I, I do think that the, the more we go on and the more the benefits, even of this small piece that we are already implemented are very much clear, uh, even the regulation, will come on our side, let me say. I can make an example, no? We had a lot of debate in Europe uh, about cloud. Uh, I work for banks and uh, you know, the regulation for, for cloud in banking was uh, very doubtful at the beginning, very, uh, I mean, uh, strict. And, and at the very beginning, uh, uh, there was no at all uh, uh, trust in the fact that cloud could be a viable solution for banks. Now, now, after the very big cases that we see in Europe about the biggest banks that started to talk with the regulator, the regulator has evolved the regulation to go towards uh, the cloud solution. I think uh, it will be the same for each technology that we are now tackling. Now there is a regulation in discussion about AI. There will be a regulation also to improve and promote the interoperability between digital twins or the finding of new standards. I am, uh, let me say, quite positive on that, but just because I look at the past experience and if we had this discussion about cloud 10 years ago, we couldn't imagine how it did, no? And then we are here and we have plenty of examples that we can make on, on the same topic. So now this is a new technology we are still in the same process, but I'm quite, quite positive that in maybe two years time, the same discussion today, we don't think about regulation or interoperability anymore. Uh, Stefano, let me follow this up with a very pedestrian question. So imagine that uh, I'm this uh, multi-talented individual in my organization. I believe in the value of digital twins. Uh, I would like to take the initiative but ultimately, I need to be able to build a business case for my CFO so that uh, she can write the check for me. 
what do you use for this? Do you have templates to actually build a business case to quantify the benefits of such an initiative? Yes. Well, yes, uh, of course, there has to be, because uh, um, as I said, uh, uh, when I cited uh, uh, BMW or, or Mars, uh, every of these case, real case has been sustained by, by a business case. And uh, um, uh, let me just highlight some of the main uh, uh, topics. Um, if you are fasted, of course, uh, you can you can reduce the cost okay so it's a clear fact that when you approach and you can prove that with this technology you will cut down your time to market there are not only you know uh, uh, positive effects on the clients on the satisfaction of the level of services on your brand uh, let me say uh, identity but there are a clear cost cutting uh, uh, example behind if you can do better your predicted maintenance or if you can better forecasting the way in which your plant has to behave in case of a of a of a fault no because that's the the real point no in case of a fault with a digital twin you can really better predict what to do and how to react reduce for example the lean time or the you know the idle time of a machine and all these kind of facts can be quantified into a business case. But just to cite some small example, but there are plenty of, okay? It's really, when you said at the beginning, if you connect the digital and virtual world to the real world, you have real stuff to look at to build the business case. So it's not paper, it's not something virtual, it's real because the connection is really true to physical objects. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I was just wondering if I could chip in on, on that, that point, because I, I think that the um, the ROI is really important um, at, at every point along the development of digital twins and then the ecosystem of digital twins as well, uh, because really the, the ROI should follow the, the purpose of the digital twin. Uh, we shouldn't even develop digital twins unless there's a very clear purpose, because the, the, the purpose of the digital twin drives everything about it. It drives the data refresh rate. It drives the fidelity of the model. It drives where a human sits in the loop. You know, we, we, we shouldn't develop a digital twin just because it's fun or because we can. It should be because it's got a purpose. You know, and that purpose can be uh, purpose and whether it achieves its purpose um, can be measured. Uh, and therefore you can actually write a really pretty clear ROI for individual digital twins. Uh, and then what I would also argue is that you can do a similar thing for making connections between digital twins, because it would be really useful for my digital twin to get some information from your digital twin so that I can make better decisions. You know, and then, then you've got a connection straight away. So what we'd argue is that the ecosystem um, should grow in a fairly organic kind of way, and it should grow one purpose at a time, very much driven by purpose. And I think the ROI can relate to the purpose. So all of that kind of makes sense, I think. What, what, what becomes quite interesting in it, though, um, I think is a kind of a game theory kind of thing, is, is, mm -hmm. which is to do with um, in order to make my digital twins work and within my own organization, you know, let, let's just say I'm a big energy organization. I've, I've got multiple digital twins. They need to talk to each other. So in, in order to do that in my own organization, I need to get my data together and I need to have a proper data model and you know, reference data, et cetera. And so, so the thing is, in order to benefit myself, my own investment will benefit me. Um, however, if I follow the rules that we just talked about, and then you're doing your digital twin of the transport system, but you're following the same rules, then suddenly the friction in making the connection between energy and transport is reduced. And so somehow or other, we need to make it that the kind of the self, selfish motivation of having my own benefit from my own investment will also enable the connections which benefit at a societal level. No, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of the questions. Uh, I'm going to pick uh, Andrew's question, and I'm going to uh, address this uh, uh, to, to Pierre. Uh, Andrew is asking, basically, who, who should be maintaining the digital model? And in fact, the reason why I'm going to ask you this, uh, Pierre, is the following. At the NV, uh, you guys have started also assuring digital models, uh, digital twins. So in that sense, uh, so who's the owner uh, when you assure uh, a digital twin? Uh, how do you go about doing this? Uh, what are some of the boundary conditions? What are some of the checks and balances that you're looking for here? Yeah, uh, thank you, Enver. Uh, 
the answer, I believe, to Andrew's question is the owner of the digital twin should make sure that it is maintained. I mean, it's like for a physical asset. But um, uh, when you sort of have a digital twin and also when you want to maintain it or update or modify it, you always need to ask yourself the question, is it really good enough for the purpose? Uh, we heard that, that, uh, that you intend to address. And uh, DNV as a provider of assurance services for physical assets, as you have said, we have now started to look at digital assets as well. So we have so-called recommended practices uh, published that um, address qualification and assurance of digital twins, as well as assurance of simulation models. And um, it's always asking the question, is the digital twin good enough? It is, is it trustworthy enough to deliver what it is intended to deliver? And uh, we are not only looking at, you could say, the core piece of software, but we are also looking at the organization that is using it. Is the organization mature enough to actually take advantage of such a digital twin? And um, you might um, also ask the question, is the organization mature enough to maintain it and to update it? And if not, uh, then maybe the digital twin over time is degrading in its accuracy and uh, doesn't deliver any longer um, sufficiently trustworthy results. And uh, when it comes to the uh, simulation models, you, you ask yourself always the question, is that simulation model really addressing the problem that you want to address? So um, is it uh, uh, the conceptual model that, that you have in mind, is it really translated properly into a, a simulation model? And uh, how does that compare with the reality that, that you see? And in all these cases, you see you need understanding of digital twins and how they work, but you also need to domain knowledge. You need to understand that what is the environment where the digital twin is supposed to work in. Without that, you will never be able to quality assure it and to understand whether it works. So it's the domain knowledge and context uh, that needs to be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it Stefano, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot on this one uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, are there specific industries where uh, it's much easier to develop and use digital twins than others? For example, you gave the example of automotive manufacturing, you gave the example of you know, consumer goods, but uh, uh, in industries where uh, information is really sensitive, and I see in the Q&A box, uh, pharmaceuticals, biologicals, uh, medical devices. Uh, here, information is also sensitive, and uh, given the fact that uh, the applications are quite, you know, uh, primordial, life-threatening, so to speak, you have to ensure that the information, you know, you, you have to verify the provenance of the information. You have to verify the quality of the information. So the issue is, are there industries where the applications would be much easier, much quicker versus are there other industries where you have other site conditions or boundary conditions, which would make it a bit more challenging? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm pitching many clients in my industry that is banking, actually convincing them that it's actually doable to make a, a digital twin also of a bank, but uh, some of them still cannot believe exactly where. Of course, uh, if there is a production process, let me say, or something that has uh, you know, uh, a, a process that can be really reflected into a, a, a digital twin by measuring it uh, with different technologies, it's, it's easier. So if we take banks, for example, I always said, you take the back office part of the, of the, of the bank, that could be digitalizing a digital twin. You take the claim parts, claim management of an insurance, that could be, no? Maybe other parts are not worth, no? Uh, as Mark was saying, it's not uh, uh, by law that you have to do it uh, uh, if, you, if you don't need it. Uh, in terms of the confidentiality and of the easiness of access of data, I have read also the, the Q&A live. Uh, uh, I agree, I mean, we would need for them uh, uh, a system that it's going into the open data uh, uh, and the open platform in a certain sense guaranteed by a 
a regulator or a, a, a by the government. Okay, so if I took the 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 the, the field you know, of uh, of health, I I think that the and we are working on it. For example, in Italy, you know, I think that the national health service should put uh, uh, some data and some uh, let me say open uh, data available, you no, know, for many use. And, uh, and, and this should be centralized and that should be regulated, that should be certified, okay? We are working on it, for example, in Italy, but we steer half away from the final results. But I agree with what uh, uh, was written in the chat as well. Thank you, thank you, Stefano. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna uh, address the most difficult question to you uh, from our audience. Uh, can you comment on the specific opportunities and issues of digital twins of humans at the local and aggregate level? Okay, um, like I say, it is, it is quite difficult. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, there's real value in uh, some aspects of digital twins of, of humans. So for example, digital twins of, of, your, of your heart, uh, so that a, um, a doctor can um, effectively do the heart surgery um, digitally before they, they they do it physically and and make it make it safer. You know that you know, that kind of thing. I think is is not controversial. Um, I think where it becomes controversial is where uh, you have digital twins representing human behaviour uh, and starting to uh, kind of understand uh, what you're doing and what you will do and how you'll behave and and what happens in society when lots of people behave in a particular kind of way. Uh, I, I think that I think that we need to kind of dig into the ethics of that. Uh, and it's one of the subjects that we haven't really um, built upon very much in in the conversation, but it's enormously important because I think, uh, in order for um, digital twins and connected digital twins um, to be useful and of benefit to society, they do have to be trusted. Um, uh, we, we developed something in, in uh, CDBB called the Gemini Principles, uh, which is built around purpose, trust and function. Uh, and if, if digital twins are not trusted, uh, then they won't, they won't work. And so in this particular space uh, of having digital twins of, of people and society, we've got to be incredibly cautious. And therefore, what I think we need to do is dig in and do some real proper discussion, uh, you know, arguments around the ethics, uh, but get to a point that we as society are happy with. You know, it needs to be a de democratic process to get to the point of, uh, of using digital twins in that way. So like you say, it's a difficult question, but the answer I think is the other side um, of discussion. Thank you. Uh, this is a huge topic and we're almost out of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you about 20 seconds each to make your final comments. Pierre, go. Make sure your digital twin is quality assured. Excellent. Uh, Stefano? Um worry about technologies, but more on your competencies to build the next digital twin. Thank you. Mark? Uh, collaborate on the rules and compete on the game in order to get to the best place of um, a federation of connected digital twins. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is, as I was saying earlier, a huge topic, and it's very difficult to do much justice to it in one hour. However, we're only one email away. We hope that uh, with this discussion, we at least whetted your appetite, aroused your curiosity or interest in this topic. We'd be very happy to continue this discussion with you through emails or through other platforms. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you very much, Pierre. And thank you, Accenture, for making this possible. And thank you, everyone, on behalf of INSEAD and my uh, team. I would like to also thank you for joining us for this event. And we hope to see you at our future Tech Talks as well. Have a great afternoon. Have a great evening. Bye.